You think you know road safety. You've been trained to know it since you were a child. You know the ads, the sleek vehicles gliding around winding ocean roads, the focus on seatbelts and five-star crash ratings, the stern warnings against texting and driving. We are conditioned to believe that safety is a matter of personal responsibility and consumer choice. But this narrative is a lie. We are about to dismantle the popular myth that focuses solely on vehicles and bad apples, revealing just how deeply in ingrained societal assumptions about the average road user are putting everyone at risk. The greatest danger on our streets isn't just the drunk driver or the distracted teenager. It is a system designed to ignore the nuanced human factors that truly govern road safety. In safety circles, they're called VRUs, Vulnerable Road Users. This clinical acronym encompasses pedestrians, cyclists, motorcyclists, children, the elderly, and people with disabilities. Basically, anyone not wrapped in two tons of steel and airbags. Our entire transportation network is built on a fundamental misunderstanding of who these people are, rooted in a concept known as the average road user. For decades, traffic engineers and policymakers have designed streets based on the 85th percentile rule, the speed at which 85% of drivers feel comfortable driving. The theoretical person this infrastructure serves is assumed to be an able-bodied adult with perfect vision, quick reaction times, and crucially, someone who behaves rationally nearly 100% of the time. Wow. This sounds logical on paper until you account for reality. Human beings are not crash test dummies. We get distracted. We age. We have children who chase footballs onto the street. We have bad days, bad moments. When you design a system that only functions safely when everyone acts perfectly, you have designed a system that is guaranteed to fail. Compare this to aviation. When a plane crashes, we don't just blame the pilot and move on. <laughs> that, that pigeon that flew into the engine should have been wearing high vis, goddammit. We redesign the cockpit, we change air traffic control protocols, we assume humans will make mistakes, so we build redundancies to catch them. On the road, however, we do the opposite. We blame the victim for not wearing bright enough clothing, then we widen the street to make cars go even faster. We have built an environment that is fundamentally hostile to human biology, and then we act shocked when biology loses to physics. But the system doesn't just fail vulnerable road users physically, it fails them linguistically. The way the media and the legal system talk about crashes is programmed to absolve the system of any responsibility. Consider the headlines you see every day. Pedestrian struck by vehicle. Car accident claims the life of a cyclist. Notice the passive voice. It's always the vehicle or the car that does the hitting, as if the machine had autonomy, completely erasing the human being behind the wheel making choices. Then there is the most dangerous word in the English language regarding road safety. Accident. The word implies inevitability, an act of God, something that just couldn't be helped. When we call a preventable crash an accident, we are subtly admitting that this is just the cost of doing business. This framing trickles down from police reports to the evening news. In a fatal crash involving a pedestrian, the only surviving witness is often the driver. Consequently, the narrative defaults to blaming the victim. They weren't in the pedestrian crossing, they were wearing dark clothes, they, they darted out. We rarely see headlines that arguably state the truth. Road designed for 50 mile an hour through a residential neighborhood functions exactly as intended, killing a resident. When you start seeing these patterns, the flawed design assumptions, the victim blaming language, you realize something terrifying. These deaths aren't bugs in the system, they are the system. They're features. For the better part of the last century, the primary metric of success for a transportation engineer was vehicle through. How many cars can you move and how fast? If speed is your priority, safety is the casualty. It's a mathematical certainty that higher speeds mean narrower fields of vision for drivers and exponentially higher fatality rates for anyone they hit. We have engineered our societies so that participation in public life almost requires owning a car. If you cannot afford one or cannot drive one due to age or ability, you are treated as a second-class citizen navigating a hostile environment. The bias is so deep we don't even see it anymore. We accept a level of daily carnage on our roads, tens of thousands of deaths a year that would cause a revolution if it happened in the sky or on the railway. So how do we make the invisible victims visible? We have to stop accepting the average road user myth. We must demand infrastructure designed for the 8-year-old child and the 80-year-old grandparent. If a street is safe for them, it's safe for everyone. 
We have the technology to stop this. We know how to design safe streets. What we lack is the political will to upset the status quo of car dominance. It starts with our language. It's not an accident. It's a crash. And somebody was at fault. It ends with our infrastructure. The road isn't just for driving. It's for living. And it's time we started designing it that way. So thanks for coming along for the ride. And thanks for watching. Ride, drive, train, fly, walk safe. And I'll catch you in the next episode. Ciao.